Hello, everyone. My name is Himanshu Gupta. And if you, come, if you have come to this session uh, expecting that I'm going to give some fancy demos of Gen AI or LLMs or uh, chat GPT based, uh, you are in for big disappointment. Uh, LinkedIn is more than enough for that, uh, or Twitter is more than enough for that. Today, we are going to talk about business case for adaptation. My name is Himanshu Gupta. As I said, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Climate.ai. Uh, we are an AI-based climate adaptation platform uh, for supply chains. Uh, we are based in San Francisco. And in my prior life, I used to work with Vice President Al Gore uh, and uh, used to be the lead emissions modeler for government of India. So today, uh, as I said, we're going to talk about business case for adaptation. Um, and yes, we all know that climate change is a big risk on value chains. But it's also one of the biggest market opportunities for businesses to improve uh, their profits, increase market share, but also improve the lives and livelihoods of people in their value chains. And we are going to talk about that by analyzing two value chains. Um, one is corn, corn value chain. As we all know, it's, it's, it's one of the most important value chain for the world from food, fuel, <clears throat> and feed standpoint. And the second value chain we're going to see is barley. Uh, again, very important value chain from both food and beverages standpoint. So, you know, we all know that Climate change is a big risk, and uh, it's, 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 it's obvious that by 2050, uh, global barley yields, on an average, are going to reduce by 54%. Right? So you, some of you might have set, seen the statistics. Some of you might or might not have seen the statistic. But why, why barley? Like, barley is an important ingredient for beer uh, that we all drink, right? So that's why. Uh, so we all talk about reduction in yields and impacts of climate change on that. But we also, what we also said is like, OK, there's a hidden risk that hardly few people talk about, and that is increased volatility uh, in barley yields due to climate change. So I know we, we heard from, uh, from BlackRock, um, Tamasek, and, and a few other asset managers in the room. So what we did was we said, can we model uh, volatility uh, in barley uh, value chains globally. And we, we, we did that for four regions uh, in the world. As you can see, US, Australia, France, and sorry, uh, Argentina. Right? Um, and then we said that at what point, we defined the tipping points of, of barley uh, volatility, which is at what point asset managers uh, would, would not consider investing in those barley farms an attractive investment. Right. At what point from now to 2100? Um, and, <clears throat> and the results surprise us. So we're going to play a quiz. And you'll see that for all the four regions, you'll have to guess uh, when would we hit the tipping points. Oh, sorry. Uh, the slides are a bit confusing. Sorry about that. I kept on speaking on slide number one. Um, so this is the slide I was talking about. We, we analyzed the Bali value chains, as you can see, and we analyzed four different regions uh, in, in Bali, which is um, Argentina, Australia, France, and the US. And you can see, like, we, we define the tipping points of, of Bali uh, value chain, which is at what point, as I said, I'm going to repeat myself, at what point would an asset manager would consider investing in these Bali farms uh, <clears throat> unattractive? or would want to move out, or if you are a food company or a head of procurement in food company, you would want to uh, remodel your value chains because you know these areas are going to become very unreliable uh, in the future, right? And the results surprised us. So as you can see, like, uh, uh, on the bottom one, uh, the red, red color shows the tipping points are going to be by 2030. Yellow shows the tipping points are between 2030 to 2050. And green shows tipping points between 2050 to 2100. So any guess for Argentina? When are we going to hit the tipping points? 20? Um, close. So Argentina is fine. Let's look at Australia. 
Sorry. Yeah. Close uh, between 2030 and 2050, right? How about France? You can see some areas are going to hit tipping points before 2030. And let's look at the US, um, where I'm based. You see how much red there is, right? So what that shows is, one is how much red there is, and the second is, even within that region, there's so much of difference, like some farms will hit tipping points in 20, below, before 2030, some farms will be fine till 2030 to 2050. And if you want to dig deeper, like what is causing the difference in, in tipping points, it could be all the way from water usage, how much water is available, uh, for growing barley, to all the, all the way from like what's happening to bees in those areas, um, and, and, and are bees available or not uh, for pollination, or could be all the way from like are there heat risks at the time of flowering, are there heat risks at the time of harvesting. There are multiple uh, factors that go into uh, determining those tipping points. So the one takeaway if you want to take from this slide is, yes, we all talk about climate change from a 2050 standpoint, but it's, it's a more immediate risk, and, and risk which are happening right in front of our eyes. So, but then when we look at corn value chain, it's also a big opportunity, right? It's not just about risk, it's also a big opportunity. So what we did was uh, we divided the words corn growing regions uh, into three tiers, tier one, tier two, and tier three, where tier one represents uh, the highest productivity uh, corn growing areas, tier two represents the, and tier three re represents the lowest productivity. And, and because of climate change, you'll see that some tier two are becoming tier one, and tier one are becoming tier three. Uh, and that presents a $17.4 billion annual revenue opportunity for players in the corn value chain. In two ways, one is you can go broad. Um, what do we mean by broad? So, for areas which are going, going to become tier one in corn value chain, or already becoming tier one in corn value chain, what kind of seeds uh, you can launch? Can you set up relationships with the farmers in there? Can you set up logistics in those areas uh, in order to take advantage um, of, of the shift? Uh, similarly, for areas which are going to become more volatile, uh, as I showed in the case of Bali, what kind of products, uh, all the way from better seeds uh, to better biologicals, pesticides, you can launch in those areas to stabilize yields and help farmers become more successful. And that also presents a big opportunity in corn value chain. Now let's talk about a use case of like, how do we help companies realize that opportunity? Uh, so this is a use case of seed industry. Um, and as some of you know, like Spain is struggling with a lot of water issues uh, for growing tomatoes, right? And, and the, the way the tomato value chain works is Tomato seeds are produced in Spain and then are shipped to a lot of, uh, look, for a lot, to a lot of farmers in Indian markets and African markets. Right? So that's a complicated value chain uh, for tomatoes. Now, Spain is becoming more and more unviable because of water issues. So many seed companies come to us and like, ask us, like, OK, so where else can we grow uh, tomato seeds for India markets and Africa markets? Uh, and and, the, and the, typically the process, the, the way process looks like is these seed companies, uh, and some of you might be here, will be sending uh, their teams to multiple locations, uh, and those teams will set up camps, like quite literally, collect a lot of data, soil data, weather, weather data, water data, report it back to the headquarters, uh, that the process takes two to three years, basically. And then, then after that, they come to a conclusion that, okay, uh, this region looks like where we can trial, let's say, a drought-resistant uh, uh, tomato for India markets, for Indian farmers, and so on and so forth. Um, so, it's like, so the entire process from, from day one to launch in the markets takes 10 to 12 years. It's very similar to how we launch pharmaceutical drugs uh, in the market. It takes 10 to 12 years. So if you remember, uh, after COVID, the highest urgency that we had was to launch vaccines in the market. We think of seeds as that vaccines uh, against climate change for farmers, right? So now what companies can do is like, okay, you are growing in Spain. You draw a circle on Spain. The platform automatically captures the soil characteristics, water characteristics, as well as climate characteristics, rolls the clock forward 10 to 20 years and 30 years down the line, and automatically populates. These are the two locations where you can conduct trials. 
for, to, for growing tomato seeds. So a process that takes basically two to three years, it happens in minutes. The so Global Commission on Adaptation said $1 invested in adaptation leads to $6 return on investment. What we have proven is that $1 invested in adaptation leads to a $17 return in ROI. There's another use case, this is my favorite, which is, uh, yes, we all know like water risk is increasing globally, um, but how do we, again, convert that into an opportunity and make a case for water resilience um, in, in agricultural value chains? So this is, one of, this is our work with one of the big agricultural lenders. What we did was, again, uh, we mapped globally uh, all the reservoirs, uh, as well as all the snowpacks in the world using satellite imagery and climate models. Uh, and we said that for a particular location, let's look at where this location is getting supply from, um, and, and how do we model that supply in the next 10 years, in the next six months, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years. That's supply. Then we looked at demand. What is currently being grown in that location? Are you growing almonds? Uh, are you growing corn? Are you growing barley? That determines demand for water, right? And, it, and then it becomes very simple. You model demand, you model supply. The difference tells you that what is going, what is going to be the viability of, uh, of growing uh, corn or barley at this location in the next 10 years, 20 years, based on water, right? And we, we use that to develop a water resilience index uh, for farmers from on a scale of A to E, where A being the most resilient uh, farm, and then E being the least resilient, uh, basically. And then what the platform also does is, we call it adaptation playbook, right? What would it take for a farmer to move from E to A at this location? Is it about investing in micro-irrigation? Uh, is it about changing soil management practices? Um, or is it about moving to a different uh, seed variety of the same crop, right? And through that transition, it presents a big opportunity for lenders to A, roll out uh, loan products on, based on micro-irrigation or better seeds. It also presents opportunity for lenders to unlock risk capital. Uh, so if they can help their farmers to move from low risk to, sorry, high risk to low risk, then that, <clears throat> that risk capital can now be invested in more areas. So we we, we, we saw that like two, with two cases, how uh, there's a business case for adaptation. It's, it's one of the biggest market opportunity uh, for improving, of course, profits, but improving people's lives and livelihoods too in the value chain. Um, and I call this like a Tesla moment in climate adaptation. And why Tesla? Because in 2017, like what Tesla did to carb uh, <coughs> carbon mitigation or climate mitigation, where in 2017, we just had like 50,000 Teslas on the road. Uh, last year, uh, sorry, last, last month, uh, Tesla sold five millionth, five millionth um, electric vehicle, basically. So it, that shift happened within, the six, within six to seven years. Now we see a similar shift happening as, as to how companies in the world looks at climate adaptation, um, where it's, it's very much a business imperative. Uh, and it's not just like governments who have to actually uh, think about financing climate adaptation. Businesses can do that, uh, but it will it, it'll be a remiss if I don't talk about the human impacts of that and, and not recognizing the urgency of climate adaptation. No matter whether we hit 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 5 degrees, sorry, 4 degrees, we are already at uh, 1.2 degrees. And within that, we are seeing the impacts of climate change we are seeing. Next week, there's going to be a heat wave uh, in, in, in the UK, and October is going to be the warmest, probably, um, uh, on record uh, in, in the UK's history. So I cannot emphasize enough the urgency of uh, climate adaptation, but also looking at my life, uh, if because of this volatility, crop prices go up, and, and because of that, let's say, uh, the prices of coffee we drink or the pasta we eat goes up. To me, now living in California, it's just a matter of paying additional dollar um, for, for that coffee, right? 
But if I look at my life uh, 20 years ago, back in India, 25 years ago, if the price of milk goes up by even like two rupees or three rupees, which is uh, uh, basically 15 to 20 percent, uh, you know, our grandma will look at her like account book and will see like where would this money come from, uh, and then she'll add water into the milk to ensure that a family of 14 and 15 have enough milk. So. I didn't want to end that at a sad story, uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that uh, uh, climate adaptation is, is a big risk, the most urgent risk, but also a big opportunity. Thank you.